sup dudes now we're going to talk about dating so we've talked about fossils um and now you can, you'll hear an argument all the time from people who are wrong about evolution like how do we know how old it is well this is how we know how old it is and it's pretty cool uh we'll get technical not too bad um but at the end it's, it gets some into some heavy stuff so hang in there um take some notes ask questions all right we'll see you there let's go um oh natural clocks this is the last time I'll use this phrase, probably. Natural clocks basically are things we can use in, in nature to tell how old something is, or tell the time of when it was done. So, uh, what's the point? Basically, you want to be able to differentiate between relative and absolute dating. Those are two different terms. You need to know what they mean. And you want to explain the various dating techniques. Um, okay, so let's get some, let's get some uh, vocab here. Relative and absolute dating, or relative versus absolute dating. Ooh. So relative dating, basically the age is known by comparing either a fossil or a layer of rock or something like that with other ones. The actual age isn't known, but we know the order of when they're laid down or, or the order of how old things are. So we can grab a, a chunk of rock and go, this part's older than that part. I will get into that in a second. Um, absolute dating is where we know the actual age of it. We, we can work out within a certain degree of certainty, but if you're ever worried about how accurate we are, we're probably talking about it more accurately than we know your age. So that's cool. But yes, um, absolute dating is when we know the actual age of the fossil to a whatever level of certainty. And again, it's pretty certain. We're pretty good. Um, so relative dating. Basically, it relies on two simple facts, two laws. First, the law of superposition, which means with sedimentary rocks, um, they're formed in layers and the youngest layer is on top. So you get, where's my pen, my thing? And we're going to... Oh, we got a laser pointer. All right, so you're like, this layer is laid down, and then this layer, and then this layer, and then this layer, which means this layer is older than that layer, which is older than that layer, who's older than that layer, and this layer is the oldest. Uh, the law of association is that fossils are the same age as the rocks that they're formed in. In other words, we don't have like 10 million year old rocks here, and... I don't know, like 5,000 year old fossils. That's not the way it works. If the rock is made there, the fossils are made at the same time. Um, so, how do we do it? It's we, we do relative dating with something called stratigraphy. It's a great word. Um, know it. Uh, basically, strata are rock layers and sedimentary rocks. So this is a strata, that's a strata, that's a strata, that's a strata. Graphy means you're making a picture out of it, so you're you know, building a picture out of the different strata. Um, older rocks are beneath younger rocks. So that's cool. We know how that works. Except sometimes it's not, which means we need to, we can't just go for one site. We need to compare it. So when you have tectonic plate activity, sometimes the rocks come together and they're like, and then they go, and they bend. And that means that the rocks up here are younger than the rocks here. That's cool. But because this is bent over, the rocks on the bottom here are also younger than the rocks which are going to be on top of it. And so when we're comparing different layers of rocks, we need to compare them to other sites, which is cool because, you know, rocks get laid down on continental scales, not small local areas. We're talking about continental scales, really big areas. Um, and here's an example from a road cutting that you'll see. Um, what you can see is that the rock this is actually a really good example because the rock bends along here. See that layer? So you see the rocks are in layers that are kind of um, on an angle. And here the rocks are in a layer like this. So if you dug straight down um, here and you kept going, what is, what's fair to assume is that the rocks are doing that. So if you dug straight down, by the time you got to about here, I don't know why I pointed as if you can see what I'm pointing at, um, if you get to about here, the rocks are going to probably be younger than the rocks above it for, uh, for a little while. And so that's why we need to compare them. Um, another way of relative dating is the index fossil. Um, check it out. It's a horseshoe crab. They're awesome. Um, so basically, these are individual, generally individual fossils are usually found in like one spot and at one time because species are fairly local. Um, however, there are some which are found globally, almost, or, or all over the place. So if you've got one species of 
thing. This is a trilobite, by the way. So if you've got trilobites and they live in one area, sorry, they live across the globe, but the dinosaur, the the fossils are all fairly identical. That means you can assume that they're the same age. Okay. So even though they're going to be in different types of rocks all over the globe, you can go this rock and this rock, which are on the other side of the planet, they're the same age because they've got the same species of animal. Most species only really exist as they do for about 2 million years at most. So, yeah. Um, so widespread fossils, we call them index fossils because we use it to relatively date fossils in different locations, which will, or strata in different locations. Um, and if you, if you date that one, so we know how old this fossil is, we can then work out how old everything else is, you know, relatively. Um, one example is the trilobite, which are all dead. Um, the closest living relative is this guy here, the horseshoe crab, who's still pretty similar, and he is awesome. Um, but this is the way it works, okay? So here in this case, we use we could use these red anemites anim here as an index fossil, okay? So they're, they're kind of all over the place. So because they're all over the place, we can use it to go, all right, so this one here, they're about there, you know, they're about the same age at the top there, and this would be also about the same age, which means these ones are younger. And then over here, we can use these index fossils from different locations. And even though this is the youngest layer of rock on top, it just means that it, the other layers have all been eroded away. This is the youngest layer on top, so it goes there at that age. And we can make this entire column to work out our time scale. And that's cool. Now we're going to look at absolute dating. There's a couple of different ways to do this. This is where we work at the actual age. But we're going to look at one. One of the different examples of it, we're going to look at one. And it is radiometric dating. And it's the coolest thing in the entire world. Um, so radioactive isotopes, which you'll remember from our, our chemistry stuff, or our physics that we've done earlier in the year, and in year nine. Um, so a radioactive isotope is a different version of an element because it's got a different number of neutrons. And the guy, these guys, they'll break down. They decay. So they break down, I should say, slash decay into other elements. Um, one example of this is potassium decaying into argon. Um, I don't think I've got a picture there of how it's happening. Okay, so they have a potassium nucleus decays. So what this means is one proton, which is what defines the atom, how many protons there are, falls apart and it turns into both a neutron and an electron. So that's what a proton is. A proton is a neutron plus an electron stuck together, sort of. Not really. Um, it falls apart and it makes a neutron and electron. And this, because it's one proton down now, it turns into an argon nucleus. Cool. It takes... Uh, Alright. So in a half-life of the isotope, half of all of that original or, or father or mother element, half of that will decay into a daughter isotope in its half-life. So, for example, potassium argon over here. All right, well, actually, here's a good way. In the original rock as it comes out of the volcano, or whatever, um, your potassium is going, it, the rock will have 100% potassium and about, or radioactive potassium, and 0% argon. Okay, sweet. Um, after a half-life, which in this case is 1.3 billion years, 50% will have turned into argon. Okay, so half of it's turned into it. Then, after another half-life, another 50%. So, the ratio is 1 to 0, 1 to 1. After the second half-life, the half of the potassium left over has turned into um, argon. And it takes, again, the same amount of time for half of it to change. So now 1 to 3, and you see that that keeps going along. It's what we call an exponential change. And it's... Do, 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 do. We can use that to tell how old rocks are with extremely high levels of accuracy. Now, we have parent isotopes, daughter isotopes. These are the commonly used ones. Um, carbon, so carbon-14. Half-life is 5,700 years. It's useful for about 100 to 30,000 years. Uh, potassium, again, 1.3 billion is it. It's useful for anything that's 100,000 years, so at least 100,000 years old, to about 4.5 billion years old. That's how old the Earth is, so that's cool. But 
the really good thing is we don't just use one. Okay, if we're looking at rocks that are older than 100,000 years old, that's most rocks, we're not just going to use this one. We're also, if they're present, going to use this one to check it and these ones to check it. Now, this is the really important thing. We don't take one date. We compare it against other dates. So we we don't just go, we're well, going to use potassium argon, and that's it. We'll use potassium argon. We'll also use rubidium strontium, and we'll also use uranium to lead, and we'll compare them. And that's really important. It's really important that you have more than one line of evidence to put your ideas together, to correlate it, to back them up. Uh, this becomes important all throughout talk about evolution. We Very rarely do you use one line of evidence. You use lots of lines of evidence to back it up. We might just talk about one, but often if you dig deep enough, you'll see that there are other things backing it up to confirm what this one piece of evidence found. And if there's not, more work needs to be done. Um, all right, that's it, and I'll see you in class.